And as the cart was going, the Ark of the Covenant, God's precious Ark, this greatest religious thing that the Jews had and to represent God's presence, was about to fall off the Ark because it hit a rock or hit some uneven ground. It was about to tip over. What would you do? It's God's precious possession. You think, well, God, I don't want it to get hurt. It's your possession. I'm going to keep it from falling off the cart and touch it. Boom, dead immediately. Well, wouldn't God understand? I mean, it was his cart. It was going to fall. It was going to break. What would it go? God said, don't touch it. Don't use your own understanding. Just let it fall. Because when God says, don't touch it, what does God mean? Don't touch it if, don't touch it if it, don't touch it. But he leaned on his own understanding, even in a good, pure sense to say, I don't want God's possession to be hurt. He leaned on his own understanding and he paid the price of death. See, we've got to quit looking at it that way and looking at it to say, Lord, I've got to do it your way. I don't know if you heard the story about the talking kite. Kite. It was up, flying real well. Little boy was doing it, and so the kite was up there, and it was talking to itself. You know, it said, you know what? If it wasn't for this string, I'd have true freedom. I could fly further. I could go further. I bet I could go even past the clouds. I could go to faraway places and enjoy it. But no, I'm tied down to this string that's attached to me. I don't have any freedoms. I can't do what I want. I can't go where I want. Who wants to live like this attached to a string? And sure enough, the wind blew hard enough one time to where he got his wish and the string snapped. But he found out the same string that kept him up or that kept him from going higher also kept him up. Because as soon as the string broke, he hit the ground immediately. I don't want to tie down to the word. I don't want to tie down to those limitations. I want to be free. But our freedom is what brings us to destruction. There's only freedom in Christ. There's only freedom in the parameters of God's word. That's the only true freedom. Because if you snap loose of that string that God's holding you, which is the word of God, he's... There are some things to do and not do. I'm not saying there's not freedom in Christ, and I'm not talking about being uh, legalistic, but what I'm saying is the things that the Scripture ties me to that seems to limit me are for my good. And as soon as I snap, thinking I'm going to have more freedom, I have less, and I have destruction. It's there for a reason, and therefore it's important to us to live by that. He goes on to emphasize it more. Don't be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord. Take him serious. Take what he says seriously and turn away from evil. Why? It'll be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. So the first promise was, if you do that, you'll get your path straight. This promise here is your body. You may even get healing and refreshment to your bones. Remember when David was in sin Man, he just said, my body wasted away in Psalms 32. And also in that same passage, he said, my vitality's drained from me. He was living in sin. He was living apart from God's will, and it affected his physical body. He said, something's going on in my body. My health is going down. And I'm not saying everything in health is tied to you living for the Lord. That's not what I'm saying. Some health things are health things. But I'll, if you're like me, I don't want to add any more to me. Any more health issue. You know what I'm saying? What I got, I got. I don't want to be bringing it on. And here he given a, a, a promise that that will be ours. Uh, and really, I think that has to do with a general well-being. Not only just physical health, but a general well-being. And then the third one is get back a portion of God's blessing. Get back a portion of God's blessing. Honor the Lord from your wealth. So I don't have wealth. That means just whatever money you do have, okay? This doesn't have to do with me. I'm not wealthy, but you do have wealth. If you got $3, that's your wealth. And from the first of all your produce, you say, well, that exempts me. I don't farm. It means how you earn a living. It's funny how we try to get around things. So your barns, I don't have barns. Well, you've got stuff, a bank. 
will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. That's a promise. And you say, well, I want that filling. Well, are you honoring the Lord with your wealth? <laughs> are you honoring the Lord from the first of all your produce, not the last? In other words, if I see what I got left, we'll see what the Lord can get. That's not what it is. The Lord wants to be what? Second, third, or fourth in your life. Only one position for the Lord. Said, if I'm not that, I'm not anything. I'm not God in your life. I'm not number one. So honor me that way. I gave you a way to know it. I gave you wealth so you could prove it. I gave you wealth so you could use it. I gave you wealth so you could demonstrate this, that I would be first. Because wealth means a lot to a lot of people. It's something God gives us and said, hey, I, I like the things I have. I like the things I can buy. Okay, now give that to me, the first part. You get all the rest to use, but honor me with this. It's not so much that the church has to have it. Yes, the Lord, the ministries of the church use that. But it's more than the church being able to use it. It's us being able to honor God to be able to say, yes, you are first. And here's one way I show it. Because it's not mine, it's yours. Matter of fact, when we were on the skating rink years ago, Brother Joe had told a story, and I thought it was, it was so good illustration to put it here. It said a church was growing exponentially. They were just growing out of their parking lot. They had so many people coming to the church that they didn't have any place to park. And so the business that was next to them was always empty on Sunday. So the pastor went over to talk to the owner of that business and said, hey, you got a very big parking lot. You know, we're busting at the seams. You're not open on Sunday. Can we use your parking lot on Sunday? And the owner said, sure you can, except for one Sunday of the year. And he said, oh, are you open on one Sunday of the year? No. Are you using it that one Sunday of the year? No. Then why can't we use it that one Sunday of the year? He looked at him and said, Pastor, because I don't want you to ever forget whose parking lot that is. That means once a year, you're going to know that's not your parking lot. That's my parking lot. And if I didn't do that, you'd think that's your parking lot. And so one Sunday, you're going to have to make a sacrifice to not use it. And I don't want to see anybody parking there so that you'll never forget it doesn't belong to you. That's kind of what giving to the Lord is. It's all His. We're just reminded each week, it's not mine. And I'll never forget that it's not mine because I'm giving you yours each week as a reminder of whose it really is. Otherwise, I might think it's all mine and enjoy all of mine and put me first and look for a straight path in life. Direct my path. Direct your path? What do you mean direct your path? It's your path. Because you own it. You direct it. You know, it's like you say, well, what is this really proving? It's really showing whose ownership. You see, if you rent a house and that house starts to lean, I mean, it's having some foundation problems. Well, you call the owner. Let's say it started to lean at 3 in the morning. You called the owner and said, hey, hate to wake you up, but your house is leaning. And the owner says, thank you for telling me because this is my house. I don't want to lean anymore and cause more damage. Thank you for calling me. I'll have somebody out first thing in the morning. We'll get that thing straightened back up. Thank you. Now let's say later on you got a loan and you bought the house from that guy and now it's your house and at 3 in the morning you said, hey, this house is starting to lean. Well, I can't repeat what that guy's probably going to tell you at 3 in the morning. But it isn't going to be pretty. Why are you calling me at 3 in the morning? It ain't my house, that's your house. Yeah, but what are you going to do? I'm not going to do anything, that's your house. You bought it, you own it, you fix it. You straighten it up. Am I correct? Proof of ownership. Uh, Lord, uh, direct my path. Isn't that your own life? That's your life, isn't it? But if I prove in all my ways, Lord, this isn't my life, it's yours. Then he directs, he fixes, he does what needs to be done. He straightens the path or straightens the house. And then the last one is, respond correctly to God's discipline. Now we're doing all of these. Each one needs to be done so we get our path straight. My son, 
Do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe His reproof. For whom the Lord loves, He reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom He delights. This is discipline. This is sometimes some spiritual spankings or some spiritual time out or some spiritual getting in the corner. <laughs> that God, now, if you're like any of us, who loves correction from your boss, from your spouse, from your friend, from your brother, from your sister? Don't we just love to be corrected? Okay, at least you're being honest here. You didn't want to be dishonest. No, none of us love correction, but it's good for us. And our children get it because they don't know all that we know. And so we have to correct them. And we have to discipline them so that we're doing it for their good. Why? Because we delight in them. We love them. We don't want to make them, have them make the mistakes maybe that we made. We don't want to have them make the mistakes that the Bible can prevent. And so sometimes we start going off our own way. That's what the Bible says. Lord, I hear you telling me to do different. Lord, I'm, I know what I need to do. I know what your word says to do, and we keep going off this way. That's a dangerous place to be, and sometimes the Lord will have to correct discipline to draw us back. Why? To harm us? No, he's already punished Jesus for all of our sins. It's just to draw us back to where we need to be safely. You don't punish your, you don't, uh, uh, you don't correct your children just because it's fun to make them cry or make them feel bad or keep them in time out. No, you do it because you love them so much you don't want them to do things that's going to harm them. And, and, and so they'll learn the lesson. Matter of fact, Proverbs adds to that. It says, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son who receives, in verse 8. But if you are without discipline, in other words, you do what you want and God never disciplines you. In other words, I do what I want, nothing ever happens. Of which you all become partakers then you are illegitimate children and not sons. It's proof that you're not saved is what he's saying. Because if you're really saved, God disciplines his own children. You see, I don't discipline other people's children. That's up to them. I only discipline my children. That was proof they were my children. And God says, this is proof that you're not one of my sons if I don't discipline you. Furthermore, we earthly we had earthly fathers to discipline us we respected them <clears throat> shall not we much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live gosh it's for our good he corrects us for our good he disciplines for our good he draws us back for his good for our good and then in hebrews it goes on to say for they disciplined us for a short time it seemed best for them but he disciplines us for our good so that we can share in his holiness. In other words, we'll be more like him. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yep. Who likes to be disciplined? It's sorrowful. Yet to those who being trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It makes us more like Christ. It did something in us to change us and we look back and saying, Lord, thank you for doing that in my life that drew me back. You spanked me, may you drew me back, you gave me time out, whatever it was, but you drew me back in that discipline. It was what I needed, it was for my good, and now I'm paying the benefits for it. Thank you, Lord. You look back and you thank your parents for disciplining you and showing the right way. And so this is what the, the Lord does for us who He loves. It's a sign of the love. It's a sign of delight. I know you're thinking, Lord, don't love me so much. <laughs> this discipline. But he is. He's wanting to draw back. Now, a lot of people say, well, the Lord still disciplined me. Have you drawn back to go where you needed to go? Yes, he's not. What, what parent, once they said, uh, you didn't clean your room, you didn't clean your room, and then they had to discipline them, and then they cleaned the room. Are they going to keep disciplining them? No, they did what they were supposed to do. The Lord's not doing it after you've done it. That's just you and that's Satan's condemnation on us. The Lord's only trying to do that for our good. You know, the story goes that uh, 
a young boy was at the lake and he had his little toy boat with a little sail on it. And so he set it on there right by the, by the shore and he put that little boat there and he'd just watch it and, and go back. It had a little string to it and he could pull it along by the shore and it was, he was having a lot of fun. Well, while he was doing it, he got distracted and let the string go and the boat drifted out and drifted out and drifted out and drifted out. By the time he saw it, it was about uh, 20 yards out there in the lake. He couldn't, he couldn't get it. And he began to cry. A man was walking by the lake and he saw the little boy's dilemma. The little boy's boat was too far out for him to get to. And so the man did something that was very confusing to the boy and everybody else that was around the lake. The man got a big, big rock and he threw it just past the boy's boat where it hit the water. And he took another one and he threw it just past the boat to where it hit the water. And the water created a disturbance, a, a, a splash, a wave. And the wave brought another wave, brought another wave. And the ripple brought the little boy's boat right back to him. See, when we're in the lake of disobedience, when we're in the lake of disobedience, sometime God throws a big rock of disturbance that creates a wave, a wave, sometimes big waves, sometimes medium waves, sometimes small waves. Lord, stop. Lord, please stop. But since we're in the lake of disobedience, and we realize we're not in the lake of righteousness, right now we're in the lake of disobedience. There's the difference. And that wave is bringing us closer to the shore where he is, the owner. Closer to the shore, closer to the shore, closer to the shore. Those waves in our life of disturbance are to draw us back to him where we need to be. He didn't do it out of hatred. He did it out of love. He didn't do it out of, I'm going to show them my power. No, he did it for love. Have you ever done that? I can say, thank you, Lord, for that big rock. I don't say I thanked him when it was rippling, but I sure thanked him afterward when I was able to say, you were drawing me back to yourself. I had drifted. I was in disobedience. Now, the Lord, like a parent, he warns us in his scripture and in prayer and whatever. It's when we finally say, no, I'm not going to do that way. And that disturbance, that rock of disturbance draws us back to him. Are we responding correctly to disobedience? I mean, to correction? Really look at how all these really lead to something, I believe. Learning and taking in God's word has a lot to do with showing our, uh, our discipleship. Obeying God's will and word has a lot to do with he's the lordship in our life. Giving back a portion to him and our blessings shows ownership. And responding correctly to God's dis discipline shows what? Relationship. Remember he said, you're my son. You belong to me. You're mine. And because you're mine and we have this relationship, I love you enough to correct you. Because if you're without correction, you are not my son. You're not related to me. It shows relationship. We have to get all these ships in a row to get the ship going in the right direction. Lord, make my path straight. Are you surrendered to discipleship, lordship, ownership, relationship, and responding correctly to his discipline? Oh, when you put all those together, your path is just going in the right direction. Your ship is headed the right direction. And your ship heads the right direction because you've yielded to discipleship, lordship, ownership, and relationship. You're headed the right direction. You're going the right direction in your life. I don't know about you. How often do we pray, Lord, give me wisdom in this decision. 
Lord, give me wisdom in this decision. I don't know what to do. I guess I'm the only one who does that because I don't have enough wisdom to know if my decision is going to be right. It, only when I lean on my own understanding. And you know, that's got me in trouble a lot. Saying, you know what? That just seemed like boom, boom, boom. That was just an easy decision. Maybe didn't need the Lord for that one. And then come to find out that was the one that really got me. In other words, big or little, we need direction from the Lord for every decision. How many decisions do we face a day? A lot. Big ones, little ones. When he says he'll make our path straight, I believe he'll get it straight. I believe he'll take some obstacles out of the way. I'm going to move those things. You're heading that way. Move that. You're making my path straight. I don't have to head out that way. I don't have to go out that way. He may just move that obstacle out of the way to make my path straight. Woo, I need that. Praise God for a moved obstacle. All right, we got three people that's got obstacles in their life. So I, I envy all of you. Praise God that God has no obstacles in y'all's life. But us three, we got them. And we need them out of there. Blow them up, get rid of them, send them somewhere. I don't like an obstacle. And God said, I'm going to make it straight. You won't even have to go around that bad boy. I'll just blow it up. I'll get rid of it. I need God's direction. We need God, divine GPS. And we have, remember I titled it Access. I didn't say you're going to get it. We've got access to it. Whether we use it or not, whether you listen to your, whatever she or he's telling you to do, that's up to you. And I've done this before. I've heard, turn left. I've said, I know that doesn't go anywhere. I've turned right. Although later on, somebody told me, you know that road down there, it goes straight through there. I didn't know that. When did they put that in there? Well, Siri knew it. And I said, I'm not listening to her. I know better. And come to find out, she's right. You see, we can get that divine direction. And you know what? It doesn't compare to anything else because Siri doesn't know the future. My God knows the future. He lives in past, present, and future all at the same time. If I only could know what that's up there, He already has that knowledge and can give me direction based on all that up there that I don't even know about. That won't go into this brain if I lean on my own understanding. He has all of that in, in my favor. And I can utilize and tap in to his divine GPS. Get divine decisions when I make it. I can get divine direction from him that won't be my own. And I can be blessed in all that we do and all that we have in life. Because life... If you look back, it had to do with good and bad decisions, didn't it? Look back. Oh, that bad one led to that. That good one, woo. That bad one, woo. Oh, that bad one, oh, gosh, man. You know, that's, you look back, that's all had to do with direction. The Lord said, come to me. Let me give it to you. And it'll be straight. And it'll be right. With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet. It's our time. Or we've heard God's Word speak to us. Now we need to let it soak in. And what do we do with it from here? And so as you just draw a circle around your life, right where you are, right where I am, Lord, we come to you, Lord, right now. God, as we've taken in these truths, Lord, we ask right now that you speak to our spirit. We know you already have been, but we want to just take a time to reflect on how this affects us. Are we learning and taking in your word? Are we obeying your word and will? Are we giving you ownership by giving, you, giving back a portion of what you've given us? And Lord, are we responding correctly to your discipline? Lord, speak to our heart now. Lord, we know that your word says that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So Lord, we know we have that victory. Lord, you don't bring condemnation, just correction. You're a great father. You're a perfect father that corrects us in such a loving way. 
So, Father, speak to our hearts so we can make those changes. We also have this time in our service that maybe you've never received Christ as your Savior. Maybe when we mentioned that verse that no discipline means no sonship. No discipline means no relationship with Christ. Maybe you've never come to a point in your life where you surrendered your life to Christ. Oh, maybe some religious activity, but did you give him lordship, ownership, discipleship, and to make that relationship? The Lord stands with his arms open as well, even today, to receive you so that you can receive him as Lord and Savior of your life. Surrender it all to him today. And today for each of us, whether he, we did at one time in our life give him lordship, maybe we've taken some back. Father, in the name of Jesus, we commit this time to you. Lord, we just pray that your will be done during this time, Lord, as we surrender to your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. As you're standing and Brother Gary plays, I'll be down front. Maybe you just want to come to the altar and pray and just between you and the Lord. Maybe if you've never come to know Christ, I'll be up here at the front to share with you how to surrender your life to Christ. But don't leave this place going home and knowing that you didn't make things right with God with whatever it is. That's a terrible feeling to, to have. But to leave this place saying, I made business with the Lord. Whether you do it at the altar, whether you do it at your seat, you respond as Brother Gary plays. Holy Spirit, breathe on me until my heart is clean. Let sunshine fill its inmost part. With not a cloud between Breathe on me Breathe on me Holy Spirit Breathe on me Take thou my heart stubborn will subdue teach me in word of living flame what Christ would have me do breathe on me breathe on me Holy Spirit Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Holy Spirit breathing on us all that we need to walk in this life with. So just a few closing announcements. Uh, the first would be uh, there'll be a parent meeting for those parents that are, their kids are going to camp, children's camp. Uh, immediately following, just make your way back here to the back. Uh, there'll be paperwork that you have to get and sign and be notarized and all that. So just make your way back to the back fellowship hall. All those parents of children who are going to camp, and we'll be uh, giving more information about that later. Also, uh, Wednesday night service. This Wednesday night starts back Wednesday night service. So come on back. Amen. Like the Price is Right used to say, come on down. Just come on down to the church house on Wednesday night. We'll be having a great time of worship. Well, I'll be bringing a message uh, that this first Wednesday and the next one. Uh, 
uh, that'll be on uh, accessing our loving Father. I just don't believe that when I just began to study this passage, it just had so much about how we have access to the Father. Just amazing. Access to God. To God. You know, and just some things that I think will bless your heart that will just remind us of the access we have to the Lord. Uh, so uh, come, that'll be the first two Wednesday nights, and then after that we'll be telling you about the Bible studies in just a sec. So mark it down your calendar, 7 o'clock, we finish by uh, 8 o'clock. We'll be having a cookie fellowship this first Wednesday night. We'll be having a cookie fellowship, so if, you can't, if you're not coming for the Word, come for the cookies, amen? So we'll be having a great time of fellowship just to get together and have some some cookies and punch and just be able to enjoy some fellowship. If, you, if you're rushed rush for time, we end by 8 o'clock, so you'll be out the door, and so we won't hold you up. So we keep those services limited to time. People have things to do during the week, so we could come out and be blessed by that. Uh, speaking of that, the first Wednesday night that we meet after that, that'll mean June 16th, we start our Bible studies. The men will get back to no more excuses and so uh, Brother Bob be leading that study for seven weeks starting on the 16th here on Wednesday nights. So what we do, we break up for the men and the women for these uh, seven weeks. And it's on No More Excuses by Tony Evans, a great study. Uh, the subtopic is be the man God made you to be. In other words, you wanna, don't want to miss this. So men, uh, starting the 16th, we'll be having that men's Bible study. I've asked Rebecca to come. She's going to give us a little word about the women's Bible study that also starts during and ends during that same time as well. So, let me get... so ladies, we get to get a uh, Bible study again as well. And we're, we've got a fresh Bible study that um, the women of Believers Fellowship, the leaders, have stood up to the challenge of writing the Bible study. So we, this has been a year in the works almost. Um, each lady took one chapter of the book of Esther and studied it and prayed over it and are ready to present that. And uh, it's been put in a book. So you don't want to miss this because it's not just a book about Esther. This is a book about the divine providence of God. And each one of us, as we presented it as a team together to each other, there was so much excitement. It's about every single character in the book of, of Esther. And it's about how God worked behind the scenes. And it's so applicable to today in the things that we've been through this past year and all the things we go through. How even though in difficult times, God is always there. And he has a purpose for it. And we can learn his ways through this study. So the reason I'm making this announcement is because we have a sign-up sheet in the back. We have to print copies of the workbooks. It's not going to be our words. Y'all are going to be digging in the scriptures, and we're going to be discussing them together and see how God works. So we need to know how many books to make a copy of if you'll sign up in the lobby. Thanks. Amen. So ladies, don't miss that. That sign-up sheet's out on the table, and so we look forward to both the men's and women's Bible study and all that God's going to do. Also, stay connected to our Facebook, YouTube, website. All the information you need to know is out there where you can get uh, updates and find out what's going on, so stay connected that way. Also, to our guests, uh, like I said, everybody's seen uh, first time here, but if you are, again, we're repeating, joining us online for the first time, go to our website and follow the guest link. We'd appreciate you filling that out. And again, we appreciate you joining us for the very first time as well. So, amen. Don't forget your tithes and offerings. Be able to serve the Lord that way in our giving. You can give in the offering boxes as you make your way out. You can give online. Uh, you can mail it just however the Lord leads you to do. But be faithful in your giving. Uh, giving back a portion of what he's given us is part of worship. And we uh, show his, uh, as we mentioned before, his ownership. So uh, just wanted to have a word of uh, thanks. Uh, I know they'll probably kill me for saying this, but I just want to thank the Weavers for uh, all the great looking flower beds out there after this freeze. So thank y'all. Um, there they are there. So I know they don't do that or neither anybody that I've thanked up here, whether it's the clothing deal or Mother's Day, they, uh, nobody does it for uh, glory, but uh, we just appreciate that. That looks so well. I don't know if you looked how bad that looked before. The, the freeze kind of made that look from green to brown. 
and browner. So thank y'all for y'all's dedication there. It looks so beautiful and we appreciate it. Uh, so don't kill me, okay? So don't. So she, she's already going to. So, but again, we appreciate they they did such good work on that. Also, this is Memorial Weekend, so spend time not only with your family, but again, as we mentioned, be be thankful for uh, those that gave their all for the sacrifices made, and 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 the families that still. Uh, are going through difficulty because of that. And because of that, we're starting this uh, week with the lift recess. So there won't be any lift group uh, to, the, right after church. There won't be lift group tonight. And through the summer, at least through June and July, we kick back our lift groups on the first uh, Sunday in August. So we'll be reminding you of that. So lift groups taking the little small recess during that time. And, <clears throat> and so be sure to make a, a note of that. Amen. You glad you came? Praise the Lord, God's good, and you're here, and we bless, praise the Lord for your faithfulness to be here and, and be a part of what Believer's Fellowship is doing. So anyway, Brother Gary, if you'll close us out, I'll make my way out, and you can dismiss us. All right. You know, I did have a friend of ours. He sent me a list of things he was in the military and the service and the Green Berets and all that. So what I'd like to do is anybody that's been in the armed services stand up first. Right now, if you've been in armed service, go ahead and stand. Military, let's give them a hand right there. All right, it's great. Appreciate that. Let's all stand together and we'll close out the service with a prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you do for us, even for these military people. Father, just giving their time and efforts in our country. And Father, we do just, uh, just pray, pray you bless them in a mighty way. Father, we lift this time to you and give you all the praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>